Hello everyone, Rachel Weaver here. I am on faculty and staff at Lighthouse Writers Workshop. I've been making a series of videos called The Story of a Book in which I ask authors to tell us the story of how their book came to be. So today we have Mario Ospedo with us. Hi Mario. Hello, how are you? Good, thanks for being here. Thank you for the invitation, appreciate it. Uh, so Mario has many, many books out, but he is going to tell us the story of his very first book, which is called The Nymphos of Rocky Flats and was published by HarperCollins. How long ago, Mario? When did this one come out? 2006. Okay. So 14 right. years ago. I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, let you tell us the story. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Rachel. I appreciate the introduction and I appreciate everybody who's hopefully going to watch this in the future in that virtual space out there. Um, and let me say it's a pleasure to be on the faculty of White House Writers. Um, it's really given me a, a great opportunity to reach out, meet other writers, fantastic writers, be part of the writing community, which I think is so important, particularly now. I have been so impressed by all the the community just flocking because i know lighthouse is really worried what are we going to do with this pandemic and the community the writing community really rose and surprised everybody uh in a good way with uh with all that support so i and i wanted to thank uh, rachel for doing this um giving me opportunity to not only talk but also i i, I listen in to the other interviews and things and it gives me a chance to learn as well because you never can stop learning that's that's always uh, a process so today I'm going to be talking about uh, how my first novel uh, got published, okay? And it is uh, The Nymphos of Rocky Flats. Here you go right there. Okay. And it was published in 2006 by HarperCollins. So I, when I was a kid, I never really considered myself that I was going to, uh, that I was going to be a writer. I mean, that was one of the things I never, I never thought about. But I did enjoy reading quite a bit. I was a bookworm and, and when I was in the high school and middle school my mom in the summertime my mom would call a local library and tell them to send me home and they knew exactly who i was <laughs> uh so i'd always enjoyed reading uh, i wasn't a very good uh writing uh student though um so uh, it wasn't until i guess around night in the early 1980s uh, i had gotten out of the army and i was back to my bookworm haunting libraries and I guess about that time, I started thinking that, yeah, maybe I can do this writing thing. Because in the Army, I used to write quite a bit, um, but mainly, mainly uh, nonfiction stuff, right? And that kind of put it in my head that I wanted to be a writer. So then I was going through the, um, through the stacks there at the library, and I picked one particular book out. And that book gave me the most dangerous thought any wannabe writer could have, which is, I can do better than this. If this guy got published, I can get published. So that's kind of like I threw the gauntlet out of myself. All right, go do it, right? And this was around 1984, 85, something like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I went out and I went to Radio Shack and I bought a computer, uh, the old Trash 80 with the, uh, the old seven and a quarter inch floppies. And I started writing. And uh, I got about 100 pages into it and I realized I didn't know what I was doing because I didn't understand, I didn't have a story. I had a, this guy doing a bunch of stuff, but why? So I started falling back and unfortunately I was, I was sort of just teaching myself and I would go over to the local Barnes and Noble and they have the Writer's Digest books and I would get those and I would just constantly read everything. Like there'd be interviews uh, with other writers. Um, I happened to live in Fresno at the time, which is at the time and even today is still a backwater. So we very seldom got any writers to actually come through. <clears throat> so most of what I picked up was through the newspaper, uh, which again, just shows you how old I am because there's not any newspapers around. And the ones that are around really don't, have, don't even have a, a book section. Remember the Sunday afternoon book section? That's all gone now. Um, so, so I started, um, it, it took me about two years to finally write this one story. And I started, uh, I started sending it out and started writing query letters <clears throat> um, and started getting rejection letters. Um, and, but it took me about two years to write a book. And then um, I'd start sending out query letters and then I start writing the next book. And, um, and I felt that I was kind of getting closer to the mark uh, of, of writing something worth publishing. Um, and I, I got some good feedback from some of the rejection letters. 
one of them was the guy goes, well, I'm really not interested in your book, but you really got to work on your synopsis. And I'm like, oh, okay, all right. You know, so, so I'm like, okay, that, you know, that was kind of, everybody hates to write a synopsis, but it made me aware that they do read them. So um, my first stab at a book was to write literary fiction. Uh, because I always thought that literary fiction was kind of one of these books that had like universal truths, right? And it tells you everything that you need to know about living and life and all that. And I thought, okay, I can tell you that. And I, I, and, I and then I started migrating for that. And what I actually started read, writing was the kind of books that I actually prefer to read, which is like men's action thrillers. And I started writing those getting closer to the mark. So finally, after I moved to Denver and I got involved with a critique group, and this is before I knew anything about Lighthouse. I was involved with Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers and they kind of took me under their wing. And I wrote this book, uh, this men's action thriller that I was certain was gonna get me published, right? I was, I was positive. And I actually had this uh, strategy of getting, uh, of getting it published because I would go and I'd find um, agents that are looking for my kind of work. And, and I would go and find out first novels similar to mine that they had represented. So this was kind of the end that I was working. And so I sent out a bunch of the query letters and I didn't even get one rejection. I mean, it was, it was completely demoralizing. It's not, you know, it wasn't that nobody even told me no. It's like they were, it's like they all got together and said, we don't even want to encourage this guy by telling him no, right? Just let him die on the vine. So I waited about, this went about 18 months, two years, right? And, and, and nothing, nothing. So I decided, all right, the hell with it. I'm going to write the most ridiculous story I can think about, which is a vampire detective investigates an outbreak of nymphomania at a nuclear weapons plant. And that became the nymphos of Rocky Flats. And that book took me about two years, uh, a little over two years to, to write. And I, and I and some friends of mine afterwards had told me how absolutely obsessed I was with writing this book. And, um, uh, you know, hardly going out and staying in the basement of a friend's house and working on the laptop and getting this thing done. Because I was, you know, I was just sort of energized about it. So I went to uh, the Colorado Gold, which is the annual conference of Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers. And I thought, okay, now the book's ready to send out to the world. And the one thing I know that I needed was a word query letter. So I attended a panel by a, um, a visiting agent who was giving a panel on or presentation on writing query letters. And it was very informative because agents themselves have to write query letters when they send out uh, the work they want to represent. And he was giving us a, his examples of this and I was soaking it all in. So after his presentation, I actually followed him out of the out of the room, and I and I gave him an elevator pitch in an elevator, and he looked at me and he goes, uh, "Well, that's different." And he gave me his card, and this was in 2014. I mean, 2004, and over the process, and then finally, I got a I, I got the book published. So it took me. I tell people like from the time I got serious about writing to the time I actually got a call saying that somebody was interested in publishing my work, it took me 17 years. So don't be discouraged because I'm a slow learner, okay? So the rest of you guys can, can definitely beat my record. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I'm interested in, um, it sounds like you had many, uh, or like many finished drafts that you, that you, basically you have books in your basement. Is that true? They're called, those are called trunk novels. Trunk novels, uh-huh. Okay. Um, I don't have a trunk, so mine are called basement novels. Okay. Um, so how how many of those do you have, would you say? Um, okay, the Nymphals was book seven, so I have six. Six mm -hmm. complete manuscripts. But how many do you have that you um, completed but then never published? Do you have any of those? Or did you loop back around to some of those earlier ones that you... No, those, those those are all dead. Six, they're buried. <laughs> there's six of them. Complete complete novels, you know. About six. Wait, there's six 80, that are six that, that are, are not published. Th those are six that I wrote before I got the nymphos published. So that was during my what I call my apprentice period as a writer. And you don't? Do you have any interest in going back and pulling some stuff from those to create new stories, or do you ever do that, or do you just consider those like that's what I was doing when I was practicing. They're, they're rotting in a shallow grave. Uh, they're forgotten. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, this is interesting because I think a lot of writers, we get really caught up in what are our darlings. Yeah. And, you know, we, I think we've all heard the expression, murder your darlings. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, when, I, when I first love those darlings and, and, and I say, you know, I, this, this particular phrase or paragraph I'm in love with, and I, and I got to the point that I had to take it out. So I, I, I got in the habit of having a file of my darlings, thinking these are so sparkly, I'm going to go back to them. And I never do. I never do. So I don't even bother. Re I mean, when it's time for them to go, they're gone. So, uh, so these books, I mean, they're part of my learning process. I mean, like an, like a, like a writer, I mean, like an artist paints things in an early period and they might go back and look and say, well, there's some things I like about this or that, but overall they're, they're not as, as good as what I can do now. I mean, because it's, you know, it's the learning process uh, of that. Um, so, I mean, there's a couple of themes and some of those stories that I think it'd be interested in going, uh, going back to, but on the other hand, there's more stuff that comes to me. I'm, I don't know about you, Rachel, but I get ideas for stories all the time. Um, you know, you know John Carter, right? Carter. Yeah. He he recently had a uh, circulating a short story that that uh, that somebody highlighted and and that and in in the description to that he talked about. Or I think in the actual story he's talking about looking at somebody on a on a subway and then conjuring up a story about their face huh. and i'm like well i'm not the only one who does that apparently yeah, no i do that all the time yeah. <laughs> um <clears throat> so i have been particularly interested in um you know this idea of like the books that we write that we move on from and because i think um i definitely wasn't at you know early on it's very hard to let go of an entire book that you wrote right so or to to convey this idea that yeah you've been working on this book for three years but you might just move on and write a different book right after this right so what sort of advice do you have for anyone who's in that situation or um maybe is worried about well what if i spend all this time on this one book and it ends up just living in my basement and it you know i've got to write like three more before i get to the point of publishing one well that's a very good question and and uh, first believe in yourself right that, that you're going to stick through this process until it happens in, in whatever form it happens um the other thing is that it's not wasted effort I, you know i i'll I, today I, you know I, I like to think that i'm a little bit more of a disciplined writer than what i was and that in the in the way that i can better you know project my energy you know to get to go start to finish right because i i better understand the writing process and then and then the the storytelling process and all that um so that one today when i start a project i know i'm going to see it to the end and it's gonna it's gonna get published in some form um but in that process i might write two or three chapters that i'll never use and i have to understand that i'm still trying to figure out that particular story and to get it to work the way i want it to work now I do not regard those six novels that I worked on and that represented 17 years as wasted effort because I was learning the process. I mean, I guess an analogy would be you just don't run a championship mile right off the bat. You have to practice and practice to get to where you to to where you can get uh, that good to be a champion miler, for example. Um, so, you know, have faith in that process. Take a look at it as as part of your journey. Like I told you, I, I consider that my apprenticeship. And had I not gone through that, I, I don't think I'd been any, uh, uh, well, I don't want to, you know, as good as a writer as I am now, however that, that means, you know, whatever that means to anybody. Um, so, you know, that's what it is. Number one, have faith in yourself. Two, be persistent, be dedicated, be disciplined. And, and that's, I, I guess one of the, that's one of the things I tell writers to be, you know, be dedicated, be disciplined about what you're doing. Um, you know, take it, take it very seriously, um, your, your commitment to being a writer. And see it through to the long haul because you'll be surprised, right? You 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 might write a book and say, "Wow, this thing! I'm really happy with this book," but you know, there's really not a lot of interest to it. And then you write a short story, and and out of the blue, some agent will say, and you get it published in some little magazine that that you think nobody looks at. And then some agent, you'll be at at a conference, and some agent will say, "Hey, weren't you the person who wrote this particular short story?" And you'll be yes, and they'll go. Well, do you happen to have a manuscript? I'd like to look at that. And you could be like, well, 
Funny you should ask that. I do have a manuscript. And I know people that that's happened to, all right? So it's not, it, it's not an impossible dream. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not wasted effort. Everything that you do is not wasted effort. It's always movement toward your goal as long as you're applying yourself um, as, as, a, as a professional writer. Yeah, I think also it's a matter of shifting your focus from product to process, right? Like I think when I, especially when I first started writing that very first draft of the first book, I thought this is gonna be a product, right? I didn't understand that really what I was doing was starting a lifelong process of writing, of creating stories, of crafting books, right? Um, and so when that one, that first one didn't go all the way through, to becoming a product, then I thought, well, maybe I've failed, right? But I, I, I didn't, I wasn't failing. I was just laying the groundwork for that process that allowed me to write the next one, which was better, which also didn't go anywhere. And then the third one that was even better that did get published, right? But I think that that difference in recognizing, am I working on a product or am I working on a process that will eventually result in a product, whether it's this particular product or not, I don't know, um, but I think I think that has helped me. Even now, when I start a new story, there's no, there's not as much, um, or start a new novel, there's not as much pressure. If I think, well, I'm going to play around with this and see if this is going to ever become a product, right? But this is part of my process to explore and try and see what it becomes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You made some very good points. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is by this guy, Lawrence Kasdan, who's a screenwriter and a script doctor. Uh, he wrote uh, The Big Chill, if you know that movie. Mm -hmm. And his, his saying is, being a writer is like having homework for the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so that's the way you should look at this, this lifelong uh, process. Um, writing, you know, I, I'm, I, I just applied for Medicare, right? So I'm 65 years old and I don't really see myself as, you know, when, when I'm ever going to give up writing. Uh, and it's, it's a journey. It's, it's a way for me to share stories and, and I enjoy that. Um, however, whatever level of your commitment to the writing process is, um, I, would, I would one, be honest about it. And, and two, you know, whatever your commitment is. I actually know some that some writers that I thought were successful writers and then one of, and then they decided I'm done. Okay, I'm not going to write anymore. Um, whether or not they actually act in the future, come back and have some itch to tell something that's a different process. But I think that they decided that, uh, you know, to move away, they were from writing the pressure of writing novels. Like if, if you're a genre writer, you're kind of expected to write a novel a year. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's a lot of pressure and because you're not only writing that novel, but you're working on edits of the last novel and then you're doing all the marketing in between and you got to uh, maintain your commercial viability, which, you know, brings up a lot of pressure in its own. Um, so there's, you know, there's that process. But if you don't want to go that route, there's other things that you can do to, you know, maintain yourself as a, as, you know, as a credible writer, right? Mm -hmm. um, in, in however way you manifest that in yourself okay i know like poets for example I, th I think poets have more pressure have pressure to write more than one poem a year i don't know how that works uh but you know always learning right always going and learning from other people um never be satisfied with what you've done um and I, I, right now i'm i'm rereading the book the what is the the, the secret life of bees oh yeah and I, you know, I read that book oh, several years ago, and I started reading it again because I want to use it in one of my lighthouse classes. And I mean, I'm just kind of blown away by the prose, <laughs> and it's kind of humbling. So it makes me realize, wow, I got to step up my game, right? I mean, because people are gonna, you know, like it or not, they're gonna compare your work to somebody else's work, and it's not that I'm competing with what she's done, but just her, just as masterful, you know, use of prose that she has. I'm like, well, you know, I can. I can maybe apply some of what I'm picking up from her uh, in some of my other work. Yeah, that happens to me a lot when I read a book and it suddenly I'm reminded of like, what else is possible? Yeah, that's correct. You know, in correct. books or in prose or at the sentence level of the construction of the plot or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for chatting, Mario. It's been lovely to see you and talk to you today. Yeah, you look great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And hopefully we'll see you around soon. And. When this is all over, you know, I think when this is all over, we get to get back 
together in person, everybody's gonna be like, what the hell was that all about? <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's hope that sooner rather than later. That's correct, that's correct. You all take right, care of yourself and have a great yeah. day. Yeah. You too.